On May 19, 2006, we started our summit push for Mount Everest with about a dozen other climbers at 11 p.m. This is a couple of hours later than usual because we were waiting out a blizzard. But we made good time passing other teams. Panuru and I were swapping turns, breaking trail. We knew from the lack of footprints and the buried fixed rope that no one was ahead. At 3 a.m., we arrived at the balcony, a natural resting place at 8,400 meters, well into the death zone. Shortly after, Mingma, Panudo's brother, arrived. He was working as a porter, carrying oxygen for another team. But now, as the three of us peered down the mountain, we couldn't see anyone. There were no headlamps. We weren't sure if we were alone on the mountain, if they had all turned around. We radioed base camp. Base camp reported unstable conditions, and it was really windy, even for that place. We were concerned a squall might form, so we had a decision to make. To continue or turn around. Below, we could see a floor of clouds with little sparks, lightning from the storm that we had just climbed through. But above, above were stars, the clearest sky I have ever seen or will probably ever see in my life. We went up. A few hours later, at 7 a.m., the three of us stood alone at the top of Mount Everest. There were light wind and flurries. The surrounding mountains were poking up from above the clouds. It felt like another world. It was spectacular. I'm often asked about that time on top of the mountain. Was it everything you had ever hoped for? Everything you ever dreamed of? And I suffer from this need to answer honestly. So it usually comes out something like, uh, well, um, no, not exactly. And as I see the disappointment in the questioner's face and the confusion in their eyes, I realize that I have no future as a motivational speaker. <laughs> but let me explain. I grew up in a family that at best would be described as indoorsy. Summers growing up were spent riding my bike around the neighborhood, track camp, summer theater, golf and tennis lessons. My fondest childhood vacation memories are of Disney World and road trips to Wisconsin Dells to ride the go-karts and visit Xanadu, the house of the future. I still have those postcards. The outdoors played little to no role in my upbringing. I would have never dreamed of climbing Mount Everest because I had never heard about Mount Everest. I spent my childhood wanting to be a doctor or a lawyer or a drummer or a track star or a princess. I could definitely rock a tiara. I had no mountaineering role models. Of course not. There were no black female mountaineers. As Neil deGrasse Tyson said, if you're going to be the first of some kind to do something, role models is the wrong way to go about it. Even Neil Armstrong never dreamed of walking on the moon. He said that going to space would have been an unrealistic ambition. In the same way, my hopes and dreams were limited by what I experienced, but what I, by what I was exposed to. LinkedIn did a survey of 8,000 professionals and asked them about their childhood dream jobs. The results in the US were predictable. Athlete, pilot, scientist, lawyer, and astronaut for men. Teacher, veterinarian, writer, doctor or nurse, and singer for women. What's notable, however, besides the gender disparity, is that these top five answers accounted for one-third of the responses from men, and over 40% of the replies from women, 
of all of the amazing careers that people can and do have. But when you think about it, it makes sense. You never meet a little kid who says, I want to be the international vice president of marketing and sales for a major corporation when I grow up. <laughs> Even though, really, that is a really, really cool job. And yet, we're constantly told that we're supposed to be pursuing our dreams, making them come true. Even that article about childhood dream jobs goes on to tell you how you can still achieve it. You know, if I still want to be a princess. But if you spend too much time being focused on what you think you are meant to be, you risk missing alternate paths that life might present. Condoleezza Rice wanted to be a concert pianist. Michael Jordan's first love was baseball. Galileo wanted to be a monk. His father dashed that dream by pulling him out of a monastery and forcing him to go to university, where he became fascinated with mathematics. And so I propose a different way, one where, rather than being single-mindedly driving towards a goal, you remain open and receptive. For me, venturing into the unknown wasn't climbing Mount Everest. I was a really experienced climber. You can find all of the route information. You can even follow a virtual climb online. My leaps into the unknown happened much earlier. They were much smaller and went largely unnoticed. When I haphazardly signed up, to backpack the New Hampshire Presidential Traverse the week before starting college, even though I had never hiked. When I wandered into a Patagonia store in Tokyo and inquired about rock climbing lessons from Jack, a tall and lanky Japanese man. When my best friend from high school suggested that we climb Mount Rainier, and I said, sure, when I didn't know where that was. A small series of yeses that set me on a path. So look for these new opportunities and adventures. And when you find them, just do it to steal from Nike. Hoping, dreaming, wishing, imagining, none of these things are doing. In the REM stage of sleep, when most of your dreams occur, your muscles go slack you are almost completely paralyzed, unable to move. So many people respond to a daunting objective in the same way. They become paralyzed, unable to take the first step. Most are surprised to hear that I only decided to climb Mount Everest four months before I summited. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't just roll off the couch. I had spent most of the previous three years climbing every weekend, every vacation. I had been to the Himalayas. I had been to almost 7,000 meters twice. But still, Everest was something very, very different. Yet, when offered the opportunity, I jumped. I took a three-month leave of absence from work. I figured out a dizzying amount of logistics and practiced techniques that I had never done. I bought a down suit that made me look like the Michelin Man. I practiced walking across ladders. I researched acclimatization schedules and route information because I was going to be climbing without a guide or a team. It was two months from when Eric Simonson from International Mountain Guides told me that he thought that I could do it until I boarded my flight to Kathmandu. There are so many more things possible than most people realize. In all likelihood, you. Not some future, more amazing, abstract you, but the actual you, sitting right there in row C, seat 116, could climb Mount Everest. It might take you a little longer, but this is not an impossible dream. This is not the unreachable star. I think of myself less as walking a path or even finding a path than surfing. Watching for waves, taking some, letting others pass, 
writing the good ones till the end, but sometimes failing or wiping out. So yes, you need to be prepared to fail. But don't become disappointed and go into a spiral, becoming despondent because your dreams might not ever come true. Sometimes adversity and failure can lead to new possibilities. I learned this lesson early from the story of my father. He dreamed of being a chemist. He saved his money through high school, enrolled in college, and then had to drop out because of his family circumstances. He worked, he took some classes on the side, and then he was drafted during the Vietnam War. But it was there that he found his true calling, working as a medic in the Army to be a doctor. Jeff Kinney, author of the wildly popular Diary of the Wimpy Kid series, wanted to be a newspaper cartoonist, but he couldn't get his comic strips syndicated. When asked about his original dream, he said that he still feels like a failure. But then he added, I feel lucky that I didn't get that dream, that I was denied the dream I went after, because I think this dream is better. What if there's something better? For me, my most fortunate disappointment involved a peak on Mount Kenya called Batian. At 5,000 meters, it is dwarfed by Mount Everest, but it's steep and technical. Twice I was turned around on this mountain, once just a few hundred meters from the summit due to hail, ice, and snow. But one time in 2007, I didn't even make it to the airport. I had to cancel the trip due to civil unrest in Kenya. With vacation time planned and nothing to do, I was convinced to head to snowy Keene, New Hampshire to knock doors for the Obama campaign, even though I had never been involved in politics. That led to stints in seven primary states, to becoming a delegate to the 2008 Democratic National Convention, to a very interesting few weeks in Goochland County, Virginia, before the general election, and eventually, to partying with Jay-Z, Beyonce, and Arcade Fire at the staff inaugural ball. Learning firsthand what it feels like when your newly elected vice president, Joe Biden, knocks you upside the head, messes up your hair, and then very gently and awkwardly decides he's going to try to fix it for you. <laughs> Not a bad break from climbing. And it's a crucial lesson because in mountaineering, being too focused on the summit is dangerous. That's how people die. You have to know when to turn around. And sometimes, you just have to walk away. A magnitude 7.8 earthquake devastated Nepal. Historic monuments collapsed. A humanitarian crisis is developing as people lack food, shelter, water, and proper medical care. Reports are that anyone from anywhere from 16 to 18 climbers died at the base of Mount Everest. And yet, there are others who are still considering continuing their climb to achieve their dream of conquering this mountain. They are almost certainly relying on Sherpas. Sherpas whose homes and villages have been flattened. Sherpas who probably have children in Kathmandu where thousands perished because that's what Sherpas do with their hard-earned money. They invest it in their children, sending them to the city so that they can have a different life. With the communication systems destroyed, they probably don't even know if their children are alive. It's hard for me to know what I would do if I had trained for months, maybe even years, to reach an objective and then were faced with the decision to quit, knowing that I might never have the money or the time or the energy to return, even though my goal was technically still within 
reach. But I would like to think that I would know that this is the time with intention and without regret to let go. Never let your dreams blind you at times when you're being called to sacrifice for a greater good. And so, may you go forth. Be curious and receptive to new ideas. Be aggressive in pursuing opportunities. Try and be willing to fail. You might find that there's more out there than you ever imagined, more than you could ever hope for, things that you never dreamed of, an incredible life beyond your hopes and dreams. Thank you. <laughs>